Well, good evening, everyone. If you're here for movie night, it's down the hallway, and I, I think the subject or the movie is Jaws, if I'm not mistaken. So, or maybe that's in a couple weeks. So, but good evening, everyone. Why don't we recap uh, where we've been over the last uh, three weeks? Uh, and this is our, our fourth class. You might recall in class one, we talked about uh, one of the first principles of secularism uh, being that all knowledge is to be valid, it has to take the form of scientific knowledge, and we showed how that was demonstrably false, that science makes use of things all the time that are not empirical or in the form of scientific knowledge, like mathematics and logic. We then in class two talked about arguments uh, from physics and metaphysics for the existence of God that are persuasive and persuasive to me and as I read through the literature we dealt with some of the objections to those arguments and why they don't seem to hit at the core of the evidence for the existence of God in physics and metaphysics. Then in class three we talked about other objections that people who are secular or perhaps anti-religious or anti-Christian will throw at you, uh, namely the historical facts around the Inquisition and the Crusades. Because often people will say, well, theocracy is the natural outcome of when religious people get into power. So we have to have a secular state and secular governance to protect ourselves from dangerous religious people, as uh, the Inquisition and the Crusades show. And then we compared that to just one century of secular regimes of people like uh, Lenin and Stalin and Mao Zedong and Pol Pot and Hitler and all of the mass genocides in post-colonial Africa and compared those body counts uh, and saw that uh, corrupt secular people in power uh, kill people probably at about a 20,000 to one rate as corrupt religious people in power and that we made that comparison more bold and stark by suggesting that secular regimes have a much worse track record in terms of how they deal with human beings than religious societies do. So that brings us to tonight. Uh, and tonight's class is entitled, uh, as you see there, How to Read the Bible, Help for Secularists and Curious Christians. You might ask, how is that a barrier to belief uh, for today. But believe it or not, the Bible is a barrier for many people uh, in terms of if you are, again, secular. Uh, in looking at the Bible, you hear all these different interpretations coming from Christians. And it can be a source of confusion. And even among Christians themselves, it can be a source of confusion. So tonight's subject is really, as it states, how to read the Bible and uh, how to uh, understand it in the context of Christianity, as well as for someone approaching the Bible for the first time. The, you know, the claim that someone will make is that, look at all of the denominations that are out there. there and in fact, I, I went to the website, the Center for the Study of Global Christianity.org, and they chart roughly 41,000 Christian denominations throughout the world today. 41,000, uh, and we could probably name quite a few ourselves here, just thinking Methodists, Lutherans, uh, Wisconsin Synod Lutherans, Missouri Lutherans, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Evangelical Faiths, United Church of Christ, Christian scientists who don't believe in the use of medicine, Christian Dior Christians who don't believe in the use of makeup. Uh, <laughs> we could just go down the list of, of different religions and uh, you will get different interpretations. You know, this diversity is confusing to people who are not Christian. They look at all the different denominations and it's confusing. And so uh, we even get a, a flavor of this confusion as outsiders to the Islamic faith. There's Sunni Islam, there's Shia, there is Sufism, which is a more spiritual version of Islam. And there's no central authority in Islam to determine uh, what the Quran means and says. And so you have, for outsiders like ourselves, uh, confusion on what is Islam. That same confusion 
uh, hits a secular person who's looking at Christianity. All these different interpretations of, of the Bible. And so, if you're like me, maybe you've, you've gone to some Bible studies that were ecumenical, and uh, inevitably, if it's a group of, say, 15 people, you might get 10 different interpretations of the passages you're reading uh, in the Bible. And so, uh, that is, uh, usually people are, are polite, and they, they kind of sit quietly and uh, sit on their hands on things they really want to say. So, what I thought I would do tonight is talk more about uh, a, a Catholic understanding of the Bible and how uh, the Bible and the Catholic Church relate to each other. I, I would add, because we will get into some spicy areas tonight, that uh, this is not an indictment of other Christian denominations or religion who do tremendous work throughout the world. Uh, think of all the spiritual and corporal works of mercy that Christian denominations that aren't even Catholic are doing in mission lands today, right now, uh, and have done so for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I'm not at all in any way indicting uh, these religions, uh, these Christian denominations who often do excellent work uh, throughout the world. So with that, uh, the framework for our conversation, and as I'm speaking, I'm thinking of both uh, Christians and people who have picked up the Bible and put it down immediately uh, because they, they couldn't uh, really interpret it. But I, I make a claim here that, and this will be a claim that flows throughout the entire presentation, that the question of the Bible, its interpretation, the fact that it exists, uh, is inseparable from the question of authority. You can't have the book without the authority and the community that put it together. So the claim I make is that the historical formation of the canon of scripture by the Catholic Church requires the same inspiration as the texts themselves to safeguard the fact that sacred scripture is the word of God in the first place. If there's no community and no church, what I will show is that you're going to have a tough time getting to the Bible itself as a text, and in particular, the New Testament. Now, why would I say that? Why would I say any of that? Well, did you know that we don't have any original text of the New Testament or the Old Testament from the hand of the author? If we're talking about the New Testament, all we have are fragments, and, and the earliest complete manuscripts come from the 3rd, 4th, and 5th century. So, well... 250 years past uh, the event of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's a long time. And so we have nothing from the hand of an author, either from the Old Testament or the New Testament. We also have different versions in the manuscripts of the same text. So the Gospel of John has many different versions of it within the manuscript traditions and families. We're not Mormons in that we don't think the Bible just dropped from the sky, completed, bounded, paperback and hardback edition with a Kindle version. It, it didn't just happen that way. Uh, there was a historical process that produced these texts and their reception. And lastly, and this is a, a linchpin, is that human beings wrote and selected the texts that went into the Old and New Testament. And they were either guided by the Holy Spirit in that selection or they weren't. And if they weren't, then what assurance do we have that the books that were selected are true to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus? So you see, the core argument I'm making right from the jump is that we have the texts that we believe are the inspired word of God and are without error as it relates to our salvation. But where did the texts come from and who selected them? And my claim is that if that process is not protected by the Holy Spirit, then what assurance do we have that the texts are faithful to the life and death of Jesus Christ? So that community, that spirit-guided community that assembled those texts had also to be protected from error in the selecting and editing of those texts. That's the claim. So as we continue, 
This historical process as I just mentioned, requires a spirit-guided community that selects and combines and edits the texts that make up the canon of Scripture. And that term canon really means, what's the rule? We believe there are 27 books in the New Testament. Why aren't there 45? Why aren't there 12? So when I say the canon, or when you read, people say the canon of Scripture, or the canon of the New Testament, they're referring to the rule of 27 books. As Catholics, we believe there's a greater number in the Old Testament than our Protestant brothers and sisters. We have six more books in the Old Testament, and we'll talk about why that is as well. When we talk about Protestant and evangelical faiths, This is, there's no other way to say this other than to say that in order for them to ground their religions and their denominations, they have to make claims about the Bible that are themselves not in the Bible. Or they're making claims, if they're not in the Bible, then what's their justification if you are a Bible-only church? If your authority as a church that opened on the street corner last month is we are a Bible-only church, you're making a claim about the Bible that isn't in the Bible, and even if it was in the Bible, that's a circular argument. You wouldn't make a circular argument that God exists because the Bible says so, because the Bible presumes the existence of God. So too, when Christian denominations make claims about their founding as we are Bible only, that's a claim that is arbitrary. It's outside the Bible. The Bible didn't think about the church that opened last month uh, as its founding. So uh, that is something that is often a struggle in, in Bible studies that I attend. Uh, but these Christian denominations that are, say, started in the 16th century or 17th century, or as I mentioned last month, uh, often are uh, making claims about themselves that are not biblical. They're non-biblical. They're prior to the Bible, or they are around the Bible. Can you give an example? Sure. Uh, the church that uh, opens on the street corner next week, that is a Christian church. It has a pastor. He was ordained, perhaps, by uh, someone. Uh, is his ordination valid? Can he confect <laughs> the sacraments? Uh, is his interpretation of the New Testament or the Old Testament as valid as uh, anyone else's? Uh, and so on. So uh, that pastor would say, we are a Bible-based church. And the point I'm making is that that's great, but um, on what basis do you have authority? And uh, ho hold that question because I have a quote later in the deck from Tertullian, who's an early father of the church from the second century, because this issue came up from the beginning, the question of authority and the interpretation of the Word of God. So uh, I, I would mention as an anecdote that um, you know, John Cardinal Newman, who was a convert uh, from the Oxford movement uh, in the late 19th century, uh, after he studied the first 500 years of Christianity, he concluded anyone who studied that period of time honestly could not not remain, would have to become Catholic. So uh, we spent a lot of time two years ago on the fathers of the church on what did the church of the first century look like? What did the church of the second century look like? There were things called bishops from the first and second century with authority. So that's why we spent some time on the fathers of the church two years ago uh, because what did the church as it came from the hands of Jesus actually look like? And how did it function? So as I mentioned here, Sacred Scripture, and in particular the New Testament, is first an achievement of sacred writers confirmed by sacred tradition. And I'll spell that out more later as well. But Augustine once said, and this is the, the, the bullet point at the bottom, that he believed that sacred Scripture was inspired because the apostolic tradition told him it was. If you think of when Augustine lived in the 4th century and into part of the 5th century, 
the texts and the canons were still in motion in terms of what's in the New Testament, what's in the Old Testament. And St. Augustine wrote that he believed that this was the inspired word of God in, in the Old Testament and the New because the apostles and their successors said so. You wouldn't appeal to the book itself. That wouldn't make any sense. That would be a circular path that you're on. I believe John's gospel is faithful to the life of Jesus because I like John's gospel. Well, that's no basis. There are people who think the gospel of Thomas is faithful to the life of Jesus. Remember the, the Gnostic gospels that will appear every Christmas and Easter on the cover of Time magazine? The gospel of Judas, the gospel of Thomas. They always come out, who is the real Jesus? You'll read this on the cover of the magazines. They, they time them for the Christian holy days. Some people think the Gnostic gospels are more faithful to the life of Jesus. Are we going to sit here 2,000 years later and adjudicate that? How could we possibly? Unless the apostles said, no, this corresponds to what Jesus said and did, and that doesn't. So we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, as we go as well. So the question is about the Episcopalian Church and its relationship to this quote from Cardinal Newman. And unfortunately, you have to be more specific because there are, again, different groups that sail under the flag of Episcopalian. So if you uh, interviewed uh, the bishops of Africa who were Episcopalian, you'd get a very different form of Christianity than you would on Episcopalians who are in Chicago or New York City. But gay marriage being one of the obvious ones, another, uh, you know, we could go down the list. But so uh, just using the term Episcopalian, you'd, you'd have to again be specific just like using the ter term Lutheran. Are you talking about the Wisconsin Synod? Are you talking about the Missouri Synod? Uh, and so forth. So why don't we keep rolling? And let's just talk briefly about the Old Testament. So as Catholics, uh, we have six more books, or seven, depending on uh, how people interpret interpret certain uh, works uh, than the Protestant Bible. And I won't go through all this, don't worry, it's an eye chart. But I want, you to show, I want you to see what we're talking about. When you look at your Bible in English, it didn't come direct <laughs> to you that way. Uh, it went through a historical formation, if you will. And this is just the historical formation of, of Old Testament text. And the things that are shaded are really the, the main line pathways to privileged collections of Old Testament books. So most scholars think that the Old Testament was written possibly uh, during the Babylonian exile. So sometime between when the Northern Kingdom collapsed, to, which would be the 11 uh, tribes of Israel, and, and Judah being the, the 12th tribe in the south, which collapsed to uh, the foreign aggressors in 586 BC. So perhaps in that time frame, these texts were collected, edited, and began to be uh, gathered in one uh, uh, scroll or collection of scrolls. And that's what that, the, in that time frame of composition to say 300 BC. Frankly, no one really knows but it's sometime between uh, some early date and around 300 BC, these things begin to show up as fragments and manuscripts. If you follow that shaded area through, you get to something called a Masoretic text. I just mentioned that for your reference. That is a privileged collection of Old Testament books that the Jewish faith uh, developed and ultimately Luther used as the basis for his Old Testament. Those Masoretic texts are also quite useful for contemporary biblical scholarship, and Catholic Bibles also make use of them. So that's that trajectory. You've heard the term, perhaps, Septuagint. 
uh, and it's, a, it's the Greek version for Jews that were not in the Holy Lands, that were called diaspora Jew, uh, Jews, who were spread out across, uh, frankly, the, the known empire at that time, and written in Greek. And it's, it's the basis for our Catholic Old Testament. And it has uh, the six more books, the seven more books, things like 1 and 2 Maccabees, Sirach, uh, Judith, and Tobit. Uh, the Latin Vulgate, as you can see in that trajectory, was influenced by the Septuagint and also the Masoretic text. And that's the, the Bible that St. Jerome put together uh, in around 400 AD. So you, you see how, as you go left to right, there's a certain genealogy almost of, of dependency, of how we got to where we got. Our first official statement by the Catholic Church, there were other minor unofficial statements before the Council of Trent in 1546, essentially defined and demarcated the lists of Old Testament and New Testament books, which is how we got the number we got. Yes? So uh, believe it or not, I got a question on what is the difference between Babylonian Hebrew <laughs> and the, the Septuagint was written in Greek, not no, no, I meant it Hebrew. Was translated from Hebrew. Perhaps, oh. perhaps not. Because diaspora Jews might have known more Greek than they did Hebrew. So the question was, did the, the diaspora Jews who were dispersed throughout the world when they wrote the Septuagint text, did they rely on Hebrew text? And the answer is yes and no. Uh, and interestingly, uh, you see a mix of both. I didn't want to dwell on this so much, uh, but I did want you to at least be aware of where does the Old Testament come from? Where does the Old Testament in my Bible come from? Okay, if we keep going, let's go to the New Testament. As I mentioned, both for the Old Testament and the New, we have no manuscript from the hand of the author. No autographed copies from the evangelist or from St. Paul, James, etc. What people who study these scrolls for a living have done is they've grouped them into four families of texts. And, and again, I won't go through this in much detail, uh, but there are four families you see there, the Alexandrian, uh, Byzantine, Western, and, and Caesarean family. I'll mention one a uh, fun historical anecdote. One of the codex, which means book, uh, of the Sinaiticus was discovered in the 19th century and the monks uh, were unknowingly using the pages of this book to light the furnace in the monastery to keep warm. And so some British or German explorer uh, discovered this and said, hey, you, you've got something here, can we <laughs> hold off and they said sure take it we don't care and so sure enough it was uh, the Codex Sinaiticus which is that with the the Codex Vaticanus are the oldest books of the complete Old and New Testament that we actually have and so I will uh, I, I took a, a little uh, JPEG uh, from uh, a photograph of one of the pages in the Codex and as I mentioned, it's, it's one of the earliest books uh, we have of the Old and New Testament under one uh, binding. And uh, you'll see that what's interesting about this, and we'll jump into this a little bit more because it helps uh, support the points that I'm, I'm developing about you need a community, an interpretive community that is spirit guided to navigate these texts. And I'll, I'll show you more about that in a moment. But if you, if you blow up uh, the codex and I just took one page from the beginning of the Gospel of John. If anyone's been in a fraternity or sorority you'll note that those Greek letters are in capitalized form uh, and in fact uh, most if not all of the Greek manuscripts we have for the first eight centuries or so are all in this block capital letter Greek format. Uh, 
so that's one thing to, to note in that. But this is, the big, this is a fragment from the Codex, and it's the Gospel of John. Uh, you'll note a couple things about it, which, which we'll get to in a moment. But if you turn the page, this is what scripture scholars are paid to do. They look at these manuscripts. They try to improve the overall text that they're working with. Maybe it's the New Jerusalem Bible. You know, maybe it's the uh, New International Version of the Bible. Whatever committee they're on working on improving the quality of that translation, you'll note that there was no letter spacing uh, in this fragment. All the letters run together. There's no chapter or verses either. That came in the 16th century. There's no commas. There's no punctuation. Nothing. It's just letter after letter strung together on, a, on a, a page. So what scholars do is they take that jumble and separate it into words by looking at it. They then break it out. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But knitted into the very structure of that sentence is human intervention centuries later to make sense of it, to put it into words, to apply punctuation. There's already human intervention to make it readable for you and I. Not all of us <laughs> have the time or patience to chase after manuscripts in the Middle East. But what's my point in, in all this? Do punctuation and other grammatical issues change meaning? I, I take one example, I could give you a thousand examples of this, but Christ's words to the good thief, Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Remember this, the words to the good thief, truly I say to you today you will be with me in paradise. Or, truly I say to you, comma, today, you will be with me in paradise. Or, truly I say to you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. Different meanings, isn't it? One says, today you'll be with me in paradise. The other says, I'm saying to you today, in some future state, not today necessarily, you'll be with me in paradise. There are tons of examples of this. So what's my point? You can see what I'm, I'm driving at, that the texts themselves have already been, I say, manipulated. I don't mean that in a bad sense. I mean that in a sense to give them meaning. But it's being done by, not by the author. It wasn't done by John. It wasn't done by Luke in this case. Is that an inspired intervention? kind of an interesting question, isn't it? So right in your text, even before you can get anywhere, your text has already been managed. So you see the Bible only claims. So that's the wind up, the pitch. It's not so simple to be a Bible only church because the text you're working with has already been managed and edited and selected. So a Bible-only church is assuming a lot, aren't they? You know, I could, even amongst texts that are in the New Testament that have been edited, uh, here's an interesting work, uh, Gospel Parallels, which you can get on Amazon and anywhere. It, it was first published in the 1950s, but if I were to just take a few examples and I'll, I'll do this briefly, uh, you'll see what I'm getting at, even with texts that we have in our Bible. Uh, suppose we start with the baptism of Jesus. And what this book does is it lays Matthew, Mark, and Luke right next to each other. So you can make interesting comparisons. So how does Matthew describe the baptism of Jesus? Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. In Mark, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So far, so good. How about in Luke? Well, in Luke, three or four verses before, John's in prison. There's no John. 
So what do we read in Luke? Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, he was praying and the heaven was opened. And then the Holy Spirit comes down. But where's John? Well, Luke had just described John was in prison a few verses before. So we could, we could go further. So what's my point in, in mentioning these inconsistencies? A, they're not fundamental to our salvation. So I'll repeat that the word of God is inspired by God and is without error as it relates to our salvation. So whether John is in prison or not may not be fundamental to the truth of our salvation, number one. But number two, if we looked at other things, uh, here, here's a nice one. This is kind of the ominous one, the Gerasene demoniac. Remember that story from the Gospels? So Matthew, and I'll just read a passage or two from each. So in Matthew chapter 8, And when he came to the other side of the country of the Gadarenes, two demoniacs met him, coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. So that's Matthew. Gadarenes, two demoniacs. Here's Mark. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Jezerines. And when he had come out of the boat, there, there met him out of the tombs, one man with an unclean spirit. So Matthew thinks there's two in the gathering region of the ten cities, Decapolis, and Mark, the Jezerine communities, and one man. What's going on? Is the point of the story to get that number right? No. The point is to show Jesus' power over the devil and all the evil spirits. But if you're a Bible-only literalist, what do you do with passages like that? I could mention many others. Uh, the Transfiguration. Matthew and Mark say, after six days, Jesus went up with the three disciples. And Luke says, after eight days, they went up. Uh, on and on and on. So uh, my point in all this is that not only within the text itself, there's a historical process, but even across the texts that are in our Bibles, there are interesting differences. Probably the last one that's interesting is the words of Jesus from the cross in each gospel. John says it is finished. The other writers have different things. Mark, uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark and Matthew have that. That complements what John wrote. So maybe there's not a consistent inconsistency there after all. But each one was capturing the words of Jesus as they heard on the cross. So my point in all this is not to say, well, therefore, these inconsistencies show that the word of God is horribly compromised. Of course not. As Catholics, we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, precisely because the apostles and their successors said it does correspond to the saving acts and words and deeds of Jesus accurately. And the Old Testament accurately portrays the history of the people of Israel as a nation and the covenant that they built with God. And that these incidental details don't compromise the inspired nature of the word of God. But if you are a Bible-only church, how do you square that? And if you are a literalist, how do you square that? Very hard to do. So, if I go a little further, there's just no getting around this issue, which I, I've often talked with length with my Protestant and, and evangelical friends, but either the Catholic Church as an institution who collected these manuscripts and codified them into the Old and New Testament, either they made mistakes doing that or they didn't. Either they can err on these subjects or they can't. And so you can't say that the Old and New Testament are the inspired word of God in isolation from the institution and say the institution's corrupt, the whore of Babylon, et cetera, et cetera, that you read on the web these days. So you might think I'm being hard on uh, our evangelical or Protestant friends, but if you read articles on the web and read the comments section, from both atheists and agnostics as well as evangelicals, these are the criticisms. That the Catholic Church is horribly corrupt, hopelessly corrupt, 
And if you hold that as a historical fact, uh, we would debate that obviously, then how do you get an Old and New Testament out of that corrupt institution that's faithful to the gospel and the life of Jesus? Question, right? And so the question is that what you're describing, Charles, isn't really debated among Christians uh, or denominations and Catholics. But I'm, uh, the claim I'm making is that the texts of the Old and New Testament are in fact a work of sacred tradition, this inspired spirit-guided community throughout time and space called the Catholic Church. And if you then assign an inherent corruption to this Catholic Church from the get-go, then as a Protestant, on what basis would you say the 27 books in the New Testament are in fact the correct ones? But see, ask yourself a question, if you exclude the book of Maccabees, which has a reference to praying for the dead, you've excluded the scriptural reference for purgatory. You see how it's circular still? You're referring to things that require an authority to decide, that pre-exists the, the text themselves, which it does. Hold that thought, if I don't answer it adequately, I'll come back to it. Because I have another example of it taking from a story from the Acts of the Apostles. And how did the early church, Peter, James, Barnabas, Paul, resolve the issue of what do we do with these Gentiles? Let's see how they solve that issue. Did they appeal to the New Testament? I'll save that and I'll come back. The way I pose this question, another way of putting everything I've said up to this point, if it's, if it's confusing or it sounds dry bones, is ask your Protestant evangelical friends, who wrote the table of contents of your Bible? Be another way of trying to isolate what I'm trying to get at. Who wrote your table of contents? You see how the book doesn't answer that question. An authority wrote that table of contents. Whose authority? That's the question. Continuing, this is again just by way of historical survey. Interestingly, the formation of the New Testament canon occurred more rapidly for Christians than it did for the Old Testament. So here we get the official statement in the Council of Trent in 1546, but by around 397 AD at the Council of Carthage, we get the consensus on what are the 27 books in the New Testament. We won't get the consensus on what Catholics believe are the 45 books of the Old Testament really until the Council of Trent. Uh, but if you look at this development, the, the Muratorian canon, that refers to the librarian who in the 19th or 18th century, I can't remember, found this canon that was dated from around, wasn't dated 200 AD, but it was discovered to be from around 200 AD. And you can see how there was a gestation period. There was a digestion of what's in the canon, what's not. Things that were disputed, like the book of Revelation, make it into the canon toward the end. Other things fall out. Uh, the Shepherd of Hermes was actually a very popular work. Uh, the Didache, uh, probably one of the oldest texts we have of Christians, estimated to be around 50 AD, probably predated the letters of Paul to the Thessalonians, which are thought to be 53 to 57 AD, uh, didn't make it into the canon, didn't make it into the New Testament, the Didache. So you see that there is a historical process by which these works eventually make it into the New Testament. Others are rejected as either worthy of study or forgeries. And on what basis would you consider something like the Gospel of Thomas a forgery? Didn't correspond to the oral teaching of the apostles and their successors. Didn't line up. This is the example I took from the 15th chapter of Acts of the Apostles. It has a little bit of everything in it, and I'll read it to you uh, concisely. So chapter 15. Then some men came down from Judea and taught the brothers, unless you have yourself circumcised in the tradition of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
This led to disagreement, and after Paul and Barnabas had a long argument with these men, it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and others of the church should go up to Jerusalem and discuss the question with the apostles and elders. The members of the church saw them off, and as they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted, and this news was received with the greatest satisfaction by all the brothers. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and by the apostles and elders and gave an account of all that God had done through them. But certain members of the Pharisees' party, who had become believers, objected, insisting that Gentiles should be circumcised and instructed to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to look into the matter, and after a long discussion, Peter stood up and addressed them. My brothers, he said, you know perfectly well that in the early days God made his choice among you. The Gentiles were to learn the good news from me and so become believers. And God, who can read everyone's heart, showed his approval of them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he had to us. God made no distinction between them and us since he purified their hearts by faith. Why do you put God to the test now? By imposing on the disciples the very burden that neither our ancestors nor we ourselves were strong enough to support. But we believe that we are saved in the same way as they are, through the grace of the Lord Jesus. The entire assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul describing all the signs and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. When they had finished, it was James who spoke. My brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon, Peter, has described how God first arranged to enlist a people for his name out of the Gentiles. This is entirely in harmony with the words of the prophets, since the scriptures say, After that I shall return and rebuild the fallen hut of David. I shall make good the gaps in it and restore it. Then the rest of humanity and all the nations once called mine will look for the Lord, says the Lord, who made this known long ago. So in wrapping up, my verdict is then that instead of making things more difficult for Gentiles who turn to God, we should send them a letter telling them merely to abstain from anything polluted by idols, from illicit marriages, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has always had his preachers in every town and is read aloud in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose delegates from among themselves to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, known as Barsabbas, and Silas, both leading men in the brotherhood, and gave them this letter to take with them. Here's what the letter reads. The apostles and elders, your brothers, send greetings to the brothers of Gentile birth in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. We hear that some people coming from here, but acting without any authority from ourselves, have disturbed you with their demands and have unsettled your minds. And so we have decided unanimously to, to elect delegates and to send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have committed their lives to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accordingly, we are sending you Judas and Silas, who will confirm by the word of mouth what we have written. It has been decided by the Holy Spirit and by ourselves not to impose on you any burden beyond these essentials. You are to abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from illicit marriages. Avoid these and you will do what is right, farewell. The party left and went down to Antioch where they summoned the whole community and delivered the letter. The community read it and were delighted with the encouragement it gave them. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the New Testament reference for that decision. How could Peter and James do that? What, what scripture were they citing to allow Gentiles in? Now, James refers to passages in the Old Testament, but that didn't make it in the letter. The reality of Christian Gentiles in the church, this lived experience of the early church, which predates anything being written down, was the basis for the decision. Okay, so... My point is that there is no New Testament reference here to justify letting Gentiles into the church. There's no new, there's so deeds and, that's deeds and actions preceded anything being written down. You could point to a hundred Corneliuses, and I'm sure there were many before Cornelius. They were never be, being referenced. Think of how the Gospel of John ends. Think about how the Gospel of John ends of 
the things that I could have written about Jesus that I didn't could fill the universe. So we, we know less about Jesus from what was written down than what the apostles knew. Yes? Were the thieves, you know, the Jews or Gentiles on the cross? I'm sorry? Were the thieves crucified on each side of the Lord, Jews or Gentiles? I don't know. Do you? No, I don't. But the question is that there are many more references to the Lord being on earth and your faith has saved you. Right. And the centurion. The, right. Many, many times the Lord himself took a Gentile into yes. faith. Yes. So the Lord's deeds themselves predate this, certainly, the Gentiles. And he didn't say, go to the synagogue and get yourself washed. He said, right. your faith has saved you, your, your faith has cured your daughter, your faith has cured your hemorrhaging. Da, 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 da. If that faith is the faith of Christianity, faith in right. Christ. Right. I'm not debating any of that. I'm not debating and in fact, the good thief died a thief. He stole heaven. But my point is that it all happened before anything was written down. And if the form of your denomination, of its authority, is we are written down only people, you are ignoring the historical process that produced the texts of what was written down in the first place. A couple years ago, when we were talking about the fathers of the church, uh, I was talking about apostolic succession. Maybe some of you remember that. Uh, apostolic succession, it's in the Apostles' Creed, it's in the Nicene Creed. We believe the church is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Why apostolic? And I remember I compared that to an extension cord, that Jesus is Commonwealth Edison. He is the power. He lights every lamp. And the apostles and their successors and the spirit-guided tradition of the church and that spirit-guided community is the extension cord through space and time. That's how we connect to Jesus. That's how we know we're connecting to the right Jesus. It's that extension cord that's plugged into the power. Now suppose there's another extension cord that appears 1,500 feet later from the power source or 1,517 feet later, <laughs> to be precise. Uh, does it have power? Does it have apostolic power? Are its ordinations valid? No. That's the point I'm trying to develop with you tonight. The actions, the lives, the lived experience of Christianity preceded the text being written down and that the structure of the church was established, not in its final form as we have it today, but in a primitive form of the apostles and their successors, the bishops. Yes, so the, the liturgical practices of the early church are interesting. And if you read the Didache, which is from around 50, you, talk, you see baptismal rites being discussed and the love feast or the Eucharist being discussed long before the text of the New Testament were written down. Let's keep rolling. Uh, this is a good discussion. These are, you can tell my Bible studies I attend always get fun because I can't always sit on my hands either. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I want to just reach back, and, and we do have time, which is good, uh, to Tertullian. And this is a quote that, um, so Tertullian lived between 160 and 240 AD, and all of the issues we're describing came up in the first 200 years of Christianity. Questions of what did Jesus mean by that? What, did, what does baptism mean? When should baptism be administered? What do we do with Gentiles? What do we do with people who collapse under persecution? Is their baptism valid? Do we need to rebaptize? What do we do with priests and bishops who collapsed under persecution? Should we rebaptize and reordain them? So, this and many other issues were swirling in the air, and uh, these heresies Tertullian is attempting to address. 
quote, but if there be any heresies which are bold enough to plant themselves in the midst of the apostolic age, that they may thereby seem to have been handed down by the apostles, because they existed in the time of the apostles, we can say, let them produce the original records of their churches. Let them unfold the role of their bishops, running down in due succession from the beginning in such a manner that that first bishop of theirs shall be able to show for his ordained and predecessor some of one of the apostles or of the apost apostolic men, a man, moreover, who continued steadfast with the apostles. That emphasis was mine. For this is the manner in which the apostolic churches transmit their registers, as the church of Smyrna, which records that Polycarp was placed therein by John. You might remember some of the texts of Polycarp we read two years ago, the martyrdom of Polycarp. As also the church of Rome, which makes Clement to have been ordained in like manner by Peter. We read the first letter of Clement, which was written around 95 AD, if you remember that. In exactly the same way, the other churches likewise exhibit there are several worthies whom, as having been appointed to their episcopal places by apostles, they regard as transmitters of the apostolic seed. Let the heretics contrive something of the same kind. For after their blasphemy, Tertullian's very spicy, very <laughs> always looking for a fight. Uh, for after their blasphemy, what is there that is unlawful for them to attempt? But should they even effect the contrivance, they will not advance a step. For their very doctrine, after comparison with that of the apostles, will declare, by its own diversity and contrariety, that it had for its author neither an, an apostle nor an apostolic man. Because as the apostles would never have taught things which were self-contradictory, so the apostolic men would not have inculcated teaching different from the apostles, unless they who received their instruction from the apostles went and preached in a contrary manner. To this test, therefore, will they be submitted for proof by those churches, who, although they derive not their founder from apostles or apostolic men, as being of much later date, for they are in fact being founded daily, yet, since they agree in the same faith, they are accounted as not less apostolic because they are akin in doctrine. And then I emphasize again at the end, then let all the heresies, when challenged to these two tests by our apostolic church, offer their proof of how they deem themselves to be apostolic. But in truth, they neither are so, nor are they able to prove themselves to be what they are not. Nor are they admitted to peaceful relations and communion by such churches as are in any way connected with apostles, inasmuch as they are in no sense themselves apostolic because of their diversity as to the mysteries of the faith. The point Tertullian is making in that is that it's the apostolic succession, fidelity to the apostles and their successors on what they said and did, that is the rule of faith. I, I can't be any clearer than that. Now, this will develop and change as time goes on. Probably by around the year 200 AD to 250 AD, as I mentioned, you start seeing those canons of the New Testament, and then the fathers of the church begin trying to explain what that canon means. So the focus begins to shift from apostolic succession to apostolic succession to explain what these texts of the New Testament canon really mean. Because they will also be debated. And the discussion gets even broader and larger and more heat after Constantine recognizes Christianity in 313 AD. Then everyone can come out in public now and debate these things fully and we get even more diversity of opinion. So you see how apostolic succession, a spirit guided community which includes as a linchpin this apostolic succession is the basis for why we have a New Testament at all. Let me stop there uh, and, and take a few questions. <coughs> right, so you're asking a question about the validity of papal elections, among other things. Right, uh, so I would, ask, I would say one thing and then we can talk after class because it's a little bit off the topic. Uh, but apostolic tradition is broader than just the Pope, though he confirms its unity. So we don't re reduce it to whoever's the Pope or the Bishop of Rome. 
It's actually much broader than that. Uh, and your question bears on the governance of the church as it relates to papal elections, which we can talk about after class. Let me keep rolling. This is a very cantankerous crowd tonight. I like it, <laughs> but you're getting me behind. Please save it right. for later. The question is, how do we know the apostolic succession throughout space and time? And the answer is bishops and their sees who are faithful to the sacred deposit of faith, which is handed on throughout time. But that's, we'll get to that in a, in a moment. Um, I, wanna, I have secularists in mind now, so I want to pivot to the topic, <laughs> how to read the Bible. Uh, but obviously this first topic is fundamental to there being a Bible. So it was important to cover it. So taking a step back, the first thing we should say, and, and this certainly is not original with me, many people talk this way, is the Bible is more like a library than a book. Oh, let me advance it. Thank you. What do I mean by that? The Bible is more like a library than a book. Why? Think about all the different authors throughout the Old and New Testament. Think of the different literary forms they used to express divine truths that we find in the Bible. The format of the Psalms versus the saga epic narrative of Genesis. Uh, the Gospels are a kind of literary form. The letters of Paul are a different kind of literary form. All these different literary forms. So the Bible is more like a library than a book. When you walk into the library and you wander over into the poetry section, do you read that the same way you might read uh, the New York Times? Well, they're both fictional, I guess, but that's a bad example. Uh, but do you read that the same way you would read the USA Today? Or, uh, and the, no, you, you have a different reading style, a different way of interpreting if you're reading the newspaper or you're reading poetry, or if you're reading a history textbook, or if you're reading something like a letter of Paul to the Galatians. I can't tell you how often this gets just misunderstood on web comments of reading the Bible the same way book by book by book like it's a newspaper. Because what that does is that impoverishes how you read the Bible. Think of the controversies about Genesis people always just immediately go to. How old is the earth? Was the earth truly created in six days and on the seventh day God rested? What does a day mean? You, just article after article after article debating this, and it misses the point. What's the point of that? Well, in part, the point of Genesis is to contrast with the cosmologies of the time. What's the first headline? That God created. So the world doesn't come from the other myths of the time, maybe the violence between the gods, if you read the Greek myths, or the Babylonian myths of the sexual congress creates, of the gods creates the universe through violence, through sexual acts. No, Genesis is saying one God created everything. That was revolutionary. Monotheism, what? What's another thing that comes out of Genesis? That, that God being the only God who created, he created things that other people worship, like the sun, the moon, or animals that the other religions made idols out of and thought were gods. What's another headline that comes out of Genesis? That Adam <coughs> names the animals. He has dominion over creation. He is a steward of creation. As Pope Benedict said, Adam was the first farmer, the first steward of creation. What does that mean? Why was that revolutionary? It means that 
creation and man and human beings have a certain affinity, have a certain relationship. Other pagan faiths of the time thought it was an adversarial relationship. Animals named us. We don't name animals. It was revolutionary. You see the fixation on a scientific subject of how old is the universe completely misses the point of Genesis that I've just laid out. It completely misses the point. Because people want to read Genesis the way they read a newspaper article. This is a problem again because we have two accounts of creation in Genesis. <laughs> Let's start there. In one account, Adam is created at the end. In the other account, chapter 2, Adam is created at the beginning. Tough to be a, a Bible-only literalist when you have two different creation accounts. That's why I go back to the Catholic Church is the primary, not the only one, but the primary interpretive community to harvest the full meaning of the text of the Old and New Testament. Doesn't mean exclusive, but what it does mean is that other interpretations on official uh, issues of faith and morals that are at variance with that Catholic interpretation are wrong. Not everything that, very little in sacred script the church says it has to mean this and nothing else. There are things, but the church leaves open most of the time the deeper meanings of sacred scripture. And of course it should because those meanings are much broader than any one formulation of them. Now those official formulations of the church, of course, are saying something that is true. But that could lead to three or four, mother, four more other questions. So it's an open-ended tradition that enables a spiritual reading of the Old and New Testament appropriately. You and I could both talk about different denominations who have very interesting interpretations of the life and words of Jesus that would contradict core faith and moral principles of the Catholic Church. But you have people who would quote scripture to you defending whatever position they're defending. That's why sacred tradition is needed. So let me, on the next page, quote a passage from Vatican II the dogmatic constitution on revelation in Latin day verbum. This is taken from paragraph 10. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the word of God committed to the church. Holding fast to this deposit, the entire holy people united with their shepherds remain always steadfast in the teaching of the apostles, in the common life, in the breaking of the bread, and in prayers so that holding to, practicing and professing the heritage of faith, it becomes on the part of the bishops and, faith, and faithful a single common effort. But the task of authentically interpreting the word of God, whether written or handed on, has been entrusted exclusively to the living teaching office of the church, whose authority is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. Now note this, this teaching office is not above the word of God but serves it, teaching only what has been handed on, listening to it devotedly, guarding it scrupulously, and explaining it faithfully in accord with the divine commission and with the help of the Holy Spirit. It draws from this one deposit of faith everything which it presents for belief as divinely revealed. It is clear, therefore, that sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the teaching authority of the church, in accord with God's most wise design, are so linked and joined together that one cannot stand without the others. And that all together and in each its own way under the action of the one Holy Spirit contribute effectively to the salvation of souls. So you see, as Catholics, not only does sacred tradition, the apostolic succession, ex explain and account for the existence of the New Testament, but it also provides a helpful function to faithfully present it to the world in every age. 
and it serves the Word of God in this way. And the Word of God is constituted on these two pillars of sacred tradition and sacred scripture. Now, sacred tradition has a very specific meaning. It doesn't mean uh, housekeeping rules in the church, like 40 days in Lent or Latin in the Mass. Those are housekeeping rules. Otherwise, you might, if you thought that Latin in the Mass was required for validity, then you would find the Last Supper invalid. So, these are the two pillars that explain how the Word of God is propagated uh, throughout the world in every era. So I have a, a training dialogue for us today, and then we can wrap up and, and take a few more questions. So this happens, oh, let me advance it, thank you. This will happen, I think, every time I, I will talk to a, a Protestant friend or an evangelical friend. Where's all this stuff in the Bible about Mary, purgatory, was even, see how I anticipated purgatory? <laughs> the popes, the buying and selling of indulgences, exactly. All of this Catholic overlay, where is it in the Bible? The question is already flawed. I hope you see that now. The question is flawed. But here's how we can answer it. As Catholics, we breathe from two lungs. It's not original with me. Pope John, the, the, John Paul II said that in an encyclical, but I like it. As Catholics, we breathe from two lungs to understand what God has revealed in Jesus Christ, sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Without sacred tradition rooted in the apostles and their successors who selected the texts, we would not even have a New Testament. Now, let me stop there. If that apostolic succession is irrevocably corrupt, as evangelicals in their rabid form believe, the Whore of Babylon, that same institution selected those books. So we have no assurance then that those books are correct. You can't have it both ways, in other words. If the Catholic Church is corrupt, it, it cannot faithfully select those texts that make it into the New Testament. So, you can turn around and ask a question. May I ask how it is you think the New Testament has 27 books? Who decided it has 27 and not 3 or 82 books? Can the New Testament as a collection of texts answer a question about its origins and formation? Isn't that kind of fundamental to understanding its inspiration? I always get the, the look of what are you talking about? And, and it was a very, initially it was an unnatural conversation for a lot of you to think this way. Because we all think the New Testament that Mark or Luke was at the elbow of Jesus with a pen and pad, noting everything that was being written and said. Uh, John was there at the Last Supper writing down everything. That's not how it happened. What were the apostles doing right after Jesus was executed? Running. They were running. They were hiding. The last thing in their mind was to even write anything down that's evidence. No. <laughs> so you see the point I'm trying to drive home. A spirit-guided community drove the creation and reception of these texts prior to them being in the canon. This is a fundamental stumbling block for evangelicals and Protestants to return to Mother Church. It's a stumbling block for people who are secular, who have never thought of Christianity, and see 41,000 denominations across the world of Christians who fight over stuff. Just as we look at Islam, it's the same analogy. We look at Islam and say, who is running this? It's the same thing for a secularist. We have a bias. If you are a cradle Catholic or a Christian, this is more natural to you. If you have never been inside a church and you're reading about this and reading about different Christian denominations, it's confusing. So tonight's class was about removing that confusion for Protestants and for people who have never been Christian before. Yes? So the question is, are you saying or... or claiming, implying that the Holy Spirit is not in the Protestant churches. And I'm saying this, of course the Holy Spirit can work through any conduit he or she or it chooses. Absolutely. 
However, Christ commissioned the church and the apostles to teach, preach, and sanctify in his name. So Protestants, the, the image I like to use is a huge well that overflows its banks. Jesus Christ continues his incarnation in the Catholic Church, and the water overflows this fountain of, of the corporate Christ in time and space, which is the mystical body of Christ, the Catholic Church, and the water overflows its banks and finds people where they are and draws them back to the fountain. And there are different churches who are closer to that fountain than others. Uh, we might think of Greek Orthodox churches that are close to that fountain sacramentally. Other denominations might be further away. Uh, you know, the Rainbow Church uh, that formed last week, uh, uh, maybe it's a little further downstream, maybe it isn't. Uh, my point is that Jesus Christ is the source of all grace to the world and that the church is his instrument in the world to dispense that grace. The grace is not confined to that, but it is through the Catholic Church that it comes to the world. Now God, that's the top-down answer. God can work how he works through grace, and there's no limit to that. The tribesmen running in Zimbabwe not right now who's never heard of God in any monotheistic sense, never heard of Jesus Christ, grace is available to that person. Is it available to him through his totem pole and the cannibalism he just did? Probably not. But it, the grace of Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church can be available to him even if he doesn't know that and has never heard of Jesus Christ. So it's not... It's not an either or, it's an and. And, and that's always a tough concept to, to grasp because people want to make it a, a either or. Oh, and, and I know. But so to summarize then, and in Vatting II said this, and this is a technical thing now, uh, but Protestant denominations uh, are ecclesial communities. They're not churches in the formal sense of how Vatican II defined a church, which is in communion with uh, the apostolic succession. Meaning they have the formal means of grace through sacraments uh, and liturgical acts. So a Protestant church that formed, I'm giving you the full answer now because you deserve it, you've been patient. Protestant churches, in quotes, are not churches in the technical sense, in the theological sense. They are called ecclesial communities in Vatican II. We commonly refer to them as churches because that's a nice thing to say. Uh, and it's common what you understand. Oh yeah, the Presbyterian Church. But technically speaking, they're not churches in the sense of being an extension of the body of Christ formally. So here's, here's, here's the point is that as Catholics, we breathe from those two lungs I was talking about. Sacred tradition, and there have been 21 ecumenical councils, starting with the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, where we got our creed from, going through time to Vatican II in 1965. And we believe these are privileged moments when they are making statements on faith and morals to be held definitively by all faithful people throughout the world, Catholics, on matters of faith and morals, that the church has this service this power to define things definitively we believe that as catholics and and the and the point i was making tonight is that in fact informs everything as well including the production of the new testament the new testament is a work of sacred tradition That's about all the time we have tonight. Oh, one question. The, the question is, the Jewish Bible, is it the same as the Catholic Old Testament? And the answer is, as far as I can see, no. The Jewish Bible is the Masoretic text, which has 39 books. Our Catholic Bible has 45 books. So we have six more books. We get, All right, good, thanks everybody.